The final topic we have in chapter seven is how do we actually detect an endpoint for a precipitation titration? The simplest way, uh, though often probably the least do often done, is to directly measure the metal ion concentration. Uh, one way of doing this is with an uh, electrode. And so this is, this is one way, basically you measure out the titration curve. And if you measure out the titra titration curve, you can find the endpoint that way, because you will see it. Uh, it will be that very large change in the metal ion concentration. Uh, of course, you know, if you have an electrode, well, you can often measure things with the electrode directly. So this is uh, not the most common way. Uh, there are two other main ways that the endpoint is determined in a precipitation titration. Uh, one is known as a Volhard titration. And in this titration, we add a complexing agent that changes colors when complexation happens. So the physical change we're looking for is a color change, and that color change occurs because the complex uh, is colored um, when the complex is formed and is not colored when it is not formed, or it has a different color at least. Um, so imagine uh, one specific example is, you know, say we're measuring chloride with silver. Um, we can add excess silver to precipitate cl uh, silver chloride. And then we'll do a back, and then you can do a back titration. of the excess silver with uh, thiocyanate. So we get Ag plus plus SCN minus goes to Ag SCN. And then we, we have some iron in solution, iron three plus, uh, and then and when the silver is used up, the iron will complex with the thiocyanate. I think it's just one uh, to make a red color. And that's how you observe the end of your titration. Okay, so that one involves a, a back titration. So there's a specific example of something we talked about earlier in the chapter. Another type of indicator is what's called a Fagin's indicator. And this uh, is what's known as an adsorption indicator. So what happens, this, this is a negatively charged species. And prior to the equivalence point, as our precipitate is forming, um, it is slightly negatively charged because of the excess chloride or whatever anion is in solution. So if we imagine our little chunks of precipitate, they have excess negative charge uh, and so our indicator, which is also negatively charged, uh, will not latch on to this uh, precipitate. But after the equivalence point, we no longer have excess negative ions, we have excess positive ions. And so our precipitate becomes slightly positively charged and our indicator, which is negatively charged, will stick onto it. And when it adsorbs, it changes color. And so it's that color change that we're looking for uh, to uh, find that we've reached the equivalence point. So it's the switch from the negative to positive 
which only happens when we have excess positive ions, which happens once we reach or, or just after the equivalence point. And so that is um, how we, we use the phagin's indicator. That's physically the manifestation that we see that, that we've reached the equivalence point. Now there's some specific indicators and ways that we can use indicators that are listed in your textbook and you can look at table 7-1 for specific examples.